Hello guys, welcome back to the show. So in this tutorial, we're gonna learn about Flask. Now Flask is a micro framework for building web applications in Python. I know I've done a lot of tutorials on Flask on this channel, but I realized that I haven't done an introduction series, which will take a user from not knowing anything to Flask. So I thought why not make a Flask tutorial and then help people understand how Flask work and how they can use Flux to build the awesome application that they want to build. Now, unlike Django, with Flux, you have the freedom to build your application the way that you want. So you can build your own login system, your own logout system, any way, in any format that you want. So it gives you the freedom to build the application the way that you want without any restrictions. To get started with Flux, what I'm gonna do is to show you guys how to set up. So what I'm gonna do now is to go into my terminal and then create a virtual environment and install the packages that I need to use the Flask micro framework. Now, inside of this terminal, what I'm gonna do is to create a virtual environment. For anyone out there who doesn't know what a virtual environment is, a virtual environment is like creating a world and inside of that world, you install all the dependencies that you need for the application that you want to build, okay? So that you don't pollute the dependencies on your local machine. So what I'm gonna do now is to create a virtual environment and in that environment, in that world, I will install the Flux dependency that I need. So in here, what I'm gonna say is that virtual env dash p python3 vemv. So I'm creating a virtual environment which is called vemv. Now that this is done, what I'm gonna do is to activate this virtual environment. And how you activate a virtual environment is by saying source VEMV, which is the name of the virtual environment, bin, and then activate. Now that the virtual environment has been activated, as you can see, I have the VMV inside of a bracket. What I'm gonna do is to install the Flux package. So if you go onto the Flux documentation, which you can find the link in the video description, if you click on installation, if you scroll down, you will see install Flux, and then copy this, go into your terminal, and then paste that in here after you've activated the virtual environment. So now that I have Flask installed, if I do pip list, as you can see, I've got Flask installed right here. So now that I have Flask installed, what I'm gonna do is to open this in Visual Studio code. Now that I have VS Code open, instead of the root of the application, I'm gonna create an app.py file. So I'll say touch app.py. So now that I have created the app.py file, what I need to do is to create an instance of Flask. If I go to the Flask documentation, it says that the first thing I should do is to import Flask from Flask. So I'll say from Flask, import Flask. So I'll come over here and say from Flask, import Flask. I'm importing Flask from the Flask package. Now that Flask has been imported, what I need to do is to create an instance of Flask. So they created a variable called app and assigned to that app the instance of Flask passing it the underscore underscore name, which is the name of the file, okay? So I'll come over here and I'll say app and I'll say Flask and I'll pass it underscore underscore name underscore like so. So again, what I did was to create an instance of the Flask app and then pass it to a variable that I've called app or I've named app. Now, if we come back to the Flux documentation, as you can see, they've created a function called hello world, which returns hello world, okay? So they've created a function. So let's go into our application and create a function as well. So I'll go into the application and I'll define hello world. And what this function will do is to return hello world like so so this is a simple function that returns hello world now if we come back to the documentation let's talk about this app dot root this app is in the creator if you watch my last tutorial i talked about the creators in python but we don't have to know what the creators do in order to use the app dot root function okay so what i'm gonna do is to just copy what they've written over here come over here and paste that over here so I'm saying that app, which is the instance of the Flask app that I've created, which is stored in the variable app. I'm saying that the app.root, if I pass it the slash URL, what I want you to do 
is to return hello world. So now we've got something in the app.py. Now we need to run the app.py. To run the app.py, what we can do is to say that if underscore underscore name underscore is equal to underscore underscore main underscore underscore app dot run and we will set debug to true. So what is this underscore underscore name and what is this underscore underscore name? What I'm saying is that if this file, okay, if the app.file is executed directly, what I want you to do is to run the app, okay? So if I execute this Python model app.py, if I execute it directly, what I want you to do is to run the app. So run the flag server, okay? So now I can go into my terminal. Now, instead of the terminal to run the flux application, what I need to do is to say Python app py when i run python app.py i've executed the app.py directly so what it does is that it calls the app.run function and then everything over here gets run okay so as you can see it says that the environment is set to production debug mode is on so when debug mode is on you can actually see the errors um, if you push to production, you need to set this debug mode to false and it says that it is running on this endpoint. So I can actually go to this endpoint. So if I come over here and then put this in here, it says hello world. Now, rather than returning just hello world, which is a string, as we have over here, we can actually return proper HTML. So instead of saying hello world, what I can say is that say h1 and I can close this h1 tag, save it. And if I go back to the browser and I refresh, as you can see, we've got hello world in an H1 tag. And if I inspect this, it is in a H1 tag. The next thing we're gonna look at is how to change the environment from production to development as you saw when we ran the Flux app. I'll go into the terminal, turn off the server, and you turn off the server by saying Control and C. Control and C will turn off the server. And where I've created the app.py, what I'm gonna do is to export the Flask EMV and then set that to development. So I say export Flask underscore EMV and I'll set that to development. Now, if I run the application, so Python app.py, the environment is now development. So that's all you need to know to build your first Flask app. In the next tutorial, what we're gonna look at is how to pass variables into the URL and then dynamically change what we see in our view page. In the last tutorial, we saw how to set up Flask and create your first web app in Flask. In today's tutorial, we are going to look at how to pass variables to the URLs and how to use templates in Flask. Let's start by doing the whole process again. So I'll close this. Instead of the terminal, what I'm going to do is to create a file called vars.py. Now that vars.py has been created, I'll go into VS Code, go into vars.py, and then start the whole process again. Again, I could have done it inside of the app.py file, but I decided to start from scratch so that we can go over what we did the last time. And before you start, make sure that you have activated your virtual EMV. So I will import Flask from Flask. I will say from Flask. I will import Flask. I need to create a new instance of Flask. So I will say app is Flask. And I'll pass it the underscore, underscore, name, underscore. And I will say if underscore, underscore, name, underscore is equal to underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore, then app.run. Then I want to set debug to true. Now, if I start the application and we look at what we did the last time, what you realize is that it is static, it never changes, it is hello world, and it will always stay hello world. So what we're going to do is to allow users to pass variables into our view function and then dynamically change what we have on our view page. So what I'm going to do is to create a function, define greet, and this greet will return for now hello. If I start the application and I go to app the root. 
So now if I start the application and I go to the slash URL, what I will see is just hello. Now we want someone to be able to come here and then type in something like Chris and then have hello Chris instead of just hello. Okay, so what I will do is to allow a user to pass in a variable into our view function. To do this, what I need to say is that if someone goes to the slash URL and the person provides a name, so I will say name and I can pass the name here as well. Okay, so I'm saying that if someone goes to this slash URL and the person provides a variable, okay, a variable, anything that the person provides, what I want to do is to pass that variable that the user provides I want to pass it to the view function and then what I will say is that concatenate that to the hello. So if I say sarpon, I have hello sarpon. If I say uncle, I have hello uncle. So we are dynamically changing what we see on the view page. So now we've seen how to dynamically pass variables into the URL. But there is something in Flats called converters. So you can actually specify the type that you're expecting the user to pass in your URL. In this case, I'm passing a name into the URL so I can specify the type to be a string. And how converters work is by basically coming over here and then typing in the type that you expect the user to type into the URL. In this case, I'm expecting a string, so I will put in a string. If I start the server now, and I type in Chris, everything works. If I type in one, one works as well because one can also be a string. But watch what happens when I change the type to int. I'll change the type to int and then instead of saying one, I'll pass it a name called Chris. I get not found. That is because one can be a string but Chris can never be an int. That is the reason why we get this error. And one thing to note is that you don't always have to have one view function. I could basically have another view function called index and this index could just return hi with an emoji okay and I can specify that if someone goes to the slash URL without providing any URL variable it should return hi if I go to the views page and I type in this I get hi and if I type in slash Chris I get not found but if I change this to a string I get hello Chris. The next thing we're gonna look at is how to render templates in Flask. Now, rendering templates in Flask is really, really simple. The first thing you need to do is to create a directory called templates directory. I'll come over here and turn off the server. And instead of the root of the application, what I'm gonna do is to create a directory called templates. So mkdir templates. Instead of this template directory, I'm going to create a file called hello.html and then I'll type in HTML5 like so. Now it is important to know that Flask uses Jinja2 template engine for us automatically so we don't have to install anything. If I come into the terminal and I do pip list, as you can see, we have Jinja2 over here. That is the template engine that Flask is using so we don't have to install anything else. It gets installed for us when we install Flask. Now instead of this template, what I'm going to do is to basically say hello, okay? So I create a h1 tag and I'll say hello, like so. Now I can come into the vars.py file and then I will say that from Flask, I want to import render template. Now that render template has been imported, rather than saying return high, what I'm gonna do is to return render template and then the name of this file, okay? So what I'm gonna say is that render template, it says that it takes in the template name and then some context which is any other parameters or any other thing that I want to pass to the template, okay? So I could say that the name of the template that I would like to render is hello.html. So I will just have to pass it hello.html like so. So now if I go to the slash root, it will render this HTML over here. And let me put an emoji here as well. So now if I start the server and I go to the slash root, I get hello pizza. So that's how templates work in Flask. Now, templates allow us to do some cool stuff. When we saw the signature of the template, you saw that we could pass it an additional context of type any. So if I wanted to pass in any additional thing to the template, what I could do 
is basically say that list of name and the list of names that I would like to pass to the template will be a list which contains Chris, a pizza emoji and Ben. So now I can basically use this inside of the view. Okay. This will be automatically passed to the hello.html file. Rather than saying hello, what I can do is to look through the list that I have. So in Jinja, this is how we look through things. So you have the curly braces, the percent sign, and then you say for I in the list of names. And what you need to do is to end that. So you say end for, so you say for I, which means for everything inside of the list of names and the list of names is what we passed in here. I want to have the UL tag, I have to have an LI tag and I want to pass in I and to render a variable we use two curly braces like that. So now if I go to the slash URL, I'll have Chris, Pizza and Ben. There's one more thing I want to talk about with regards to templates. Now, if you're building a complex application, you realize that most of the templates will have the same elements, all right? Will have a lot of things repeating. So if I had an about page, I would have to go into the template file and create about.html, copy this whole thing, paste that here. And the only thing that I'll be changing is the body, okay? and maybe the title because I would like this to be about. So Jinja has a way of having a layout or a base HTML file, which will be used for all the pages on your app or on your website. So basically what I can do is instead of having lots of files, which have the same elements repeating stuff every single time, what we like in software engineering is the drive principle. So don't repeat yourself. So what we're gonna do is to create a base.html file and instead of this base.html file is to let the user inject whatever they want into the body and keep the rest. So what I'm going to do is to have this over here and I'll say block content Then I'll come over here. Then I'll always have to end the block. So I'll say end block content like so. So now if I go into the about.html file, instead of having all this here, what I could do is to remove this and instead say extends base dot html so what i'm saying is that i need everything that is in here i'm extending the base dot html file instead of my about dot html file and the only thing that i would like to change is the things inside of the block content so i'll copy this i'll paste this here and i'll say block then i'll say about page and i can put this inside of a tag so i can say h1 if i go to my vars.py what I can do is to create an about root and the template that I would like to render is the about.html file. And let me create a hello.html file just so I don't get an error. So now if I start the application and I go to the slash about root, I should see about page. Okay. If I change something in the base.html because it is being used across all the HTML files, if I change something here, instead of the body. So I say, Hey Ben, and I refresh this. You also see, Hey Ben over here. So the basis will be used across all the HTML files. And the only thing I'll be changing is the things inside of the block content. I hope this makes sense. So that is all you need to know about templates and passing variables in the URL. A recap of what I did to pass variables into the URL. All you need to do is to specify what variable you want to pass into the URL. You pass that variable into your view function. In this instance, I created a function called greet. We took in the name and then rendered the name. So if I go to the slash name, which could be any name. So I'll put in Sarpon, I see hello Sarpon. So that's how you pass variables into the URL to dynamically change what we see on the view page. We saw how to use templates in Flask. We saw how to use a single template and we saw how to use a base template, which can be used across all the templates that you have. So in the last video, we looked at how to use templates in Flask. In today's video, we're going to learn how to use the two basic HTTP methods in Flask. So get and post. Get is basically sending data to a client and post is basically sending data to a server. So if I open the browser and I type in GitHub and I hit enter, what I just did was that I sent a get request to the server to get data. 
Whereas if I have a form and I click on submit, what I'm actually doing is that I'm sending data to the server rather than getting data from the server. So this is what we're gonna look at today using Flask and see how we can do the same thing in Flask. So by default, if you don't specify the request method inside of your view function, the request method is get request. So if I import request from Flask and I create a variable called request method, which will be assigned to request the method and I pass the request method to the hello.html template. So I will say request method is request method. Okay, so if I go into the hello.html file and I try to see what request method I get when I make a request to the slash URL, you will see that the request is get. If I go into the hello.html file, you can see that the request method over here is this variable that I've just passed to it, okay? So the request method is basically this. So if I start the server and I go to this URL, it says hello and the request method is get. So we know that by default, the request method is get, but you can also specify the request method if you want. You can be explicit, which is what I tend to do. And the way that you do that is basically by going into your app.root the creator so my app.root the creator and passing it the request method that you would like the view function to accept so in this case we would like you to accept just get so if i come over here and i can pass it methods and it will be a list of methods and the method that i want to pass it is get So you can explicitly declare that the method that you want to pass or you want this view function to accept is a get method. So if I come over here and I hit enter, it still works. You can also pass it more than one method. So I can pass it a get method and I can pass it a post method as well. So I could say get and post. That is, if I want this function or if I want this view function to accept a get request and a put request at the same time. We will come to that later on. So the question that I'm asking myself is that what if I decide to remove the get method and tell this view function that the method that it accepts is just post. If I try to make a get request to the slash URL, what will happen? Well, let's see what happens. When I make a get request to that slash URL, I get method not allowed because the method that I'm telling this slash URL to take is just a post request. Now let's look at how we can use post request in Flask. The way that we're gonna use the post request is basically send data to the server. In order to send data to the server, I need to create a form. So inside of the hello.html file, what I'm gonna do is to create a form, okay? So I'm gonna create a form, and in this form, I'll create two input fields, one for first name and one for last name. And the last thing that I'll do is to create an input field, which will be of type submit. And what I'll do is to say the method is a post. And then when I submit the form, where do I want the information to go? The information that I put in the input field, where do I want that information to go? Well, instead of the app.py file, I'll specify that this slash root also takes in a push request. So I will say that send the information to slash, okay? So I'll come over here and I'll specify the action to be slash, like so. So now if I go to the slash URL, I see first name, last name, and submit. Now when I click on submit, you realize that did change to post because the request method is now post because I submitted to that URL. Now let's pass in data into the input field and let's see how we can handle that data in our view function. So if I come over here, let me just print out what gets logged in the terminal when I submit something, the data that gets logged so that we can find a way to retrieve that data. So I will say that if the request, the method, if the request method is posts, what I would like to do is to print the request Dot form. Then let me put something around it so that we know what is being logged in the terminal. I'm also going to create a function called name and I'll redirect to that name if a form is submitted. So I'll define a function called name and I will say return. 
right now what i'll return is just name okay and then if a request method is post what i would like to do is to redirect to this name url so i need to pass it up the root and i'll give it slash name so in order to redirect i need to import redirect from flask so i'll say redirect and i need to import url4 so that i can redirect to that url so i'm saying that if the request method is post what i would like you to do is to return redirect url for this view function so name all i've done is that i'm saying that if the request method is post so if i click on the submit button what i would like to do is to print out or print in the terminal the request.form which will print out the data that was input by the user in the form and i would like to redirect to the url for name which means redirect to this root so now if i start the server everything is working i put in sarpon and i put in chris and i click submit so it's url for name string so if i start the thing again and i put in sarpon and i put in chris and i click on submit it redirects me to the name so slash name but let's see what gets printed out in the terminal so in the terminal as you can see i've got an immutable dict which means an immutable dictionary which has first name set to sarpon and the last name set to chris and i'm sure you're wondering where this first name and last name are coming from so if i go back to the form the name of the input field which takes the name which takes the first name is called first name and the name of the input field which takes the last name is called last name so those are the keys and the value is basically what the user inputs inside of the form so now let's find a way to retrieve this we know that it is a dictionary so what we can say is that if the request method is post i will go ahead and retrieve the first name so i'll say user will be request dot form and request of form returns a dictionary and we want the first name so i can get the first name which is basically this so let me make this first name instead of user so the first name will be request of form and i'm extracting the first name from the dictionary and what i can do is that instead of saying slash name what i can do is to pass to this root the name that i get from here so i can specify slash and i can say string and i can say first name and i can specify the first name here as well like so so now i can say url for name and i can pass it the first name to be this first name so now if i go to the slash url and i submit something so on the slash url if i put in sarpon and i put in chris then i click on submit as you can see, I have SAP on here. So basically, that's how we use the HTTP method in Flask. So what we've seen is how to use the HTTP method GET and how to use HTTP method POST. We've seen that GET is used to get something from the client or something from the server. And then HTTP POST is used to send data to the server. In the last video tutorial, we saw how to use HTTP methods in Flask. So GET and POST. In today's video, we're going to look how to use web forms in Flask. To use web forms in Flask, what we're going to do is to use something called WT Forms. So I'll go ahead and install WT Forms using the pip install Flask WT Forms. Make sure you have your virtual environment activated so that you don't pollute the namespace of your environment. So I'll go ahead and say pip install WT Forms. Okay, now that this is done, I'll go ahead and create a file called forms.py inside of the root of my application. So I'll say touch forms.py. Since we are working with web forms in Flask, the first thing we need to do is to specify a secret key inside of the application config. So I'll go ahead and say app.config secret key and I'll assign the secret key to any key that I want. So the value for the secret key is password. Now, the secret key is something that Flux uses to protect your web form against nasty attack called cross-site request forgery or CSRF, okay? So that when people attack your thing, Flux uses that secret key to protect 
your um, your application. Um, I don't want to get too much into details because that is not needed. Um, you can get into details and find out more about the secret key once you start using Flats and get better at it. But for now, know that the secret key is something that Flats key uses to protect your web form against nasty attack by hackers. So now that the secret key has been defined, I can go into the form and then create a form that I want. So the Flux WTF extension uses Python classes to represent web form. A form class simply defines the fields of the form as class variables. Okay, so the fields of the form will be class variables. So the first thing I need to do is to say that from Flask WTF import Flux form. The next thing that I need to do is to import the fields that I need and the fields can be imported from WT forms. It is important to know that you can import lots of fields from WT forms. It has fields like boolean fields, date fields, file fields, it has a lot of fields. So if you check the WT forms documentation, you will find all the fields that you can import from WT forms. What I'm going to use is the text area field. So I'll go back to the code and I'll say from WT forms import, I'll import text area field. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the Flux WTF extension uses Python classes to represent web forms. So I will define a class called to do. So I'll say class to do, and this class will inherit from the Flux form. Okay. So I'll pass in the Flux form because it needs to inherit from the Flux form. And what I will specify is the content. So I will say content, which will be a class variable and the content will be the text area field and with the text area field you can give it lots of options you can give it a label you can give it the validated filters and lots more and I'm going to give it a validator which will say that data is required so you cannot basically leave the form empty and I need to import that from WT forms so I'll say from WT forms validators import data required like so Okay, so now I have data required. What I need to do is to specify that the validators will be a list. So you can pass the list of validators. The validator that I would like to pass it is data required. So I'll say data required like so. The next thing I'm going to do is to give it a submit field. Okay, so I'll say submit and this submit will be a submit field. So I need to import submit field from WT forms and I'll say submit field and I'll say submit to do and that is it for the forms and all I did was to create a class and specify some class variables this is because the flux WTF extension uses Python classes to represent web forms and a form class simply defines fields of the form as class variables so I imported from WTF I imported the flux form and then from WTF forms I imported the text area field and submit field because those are the fields that I want my form to have and I imported just one validator, which is the data required validator. So now the question is, how do I use this form instead of my view function? Well, that is simple. What I can do is to import the form into the app.py file. So I'll say from forms import, I'll import to do, and I'll define a simple view function called to do. So I'll say def to do, and for now I'll say app the root slash to do, that will be the endpoint and the method if you don't specify is a get method but i would like to be explicit and i'll say methods and i'll set the method to get the way to use this form is that i need to create an instance of the form because the form is a class since i have the form imported over here what i can say is to do form will be an instance of to do and i can pass this to the template so i'll say return render template and I need to create a template. So I will say to do dot HTML inside of the template. This will extend block content. Now I can go back to the app and I'll say return render template. The HTML file that I want to render will be the to do dot HTML file. So I will say to do dot HTML. And then the form can be passed as context because I can pass lots of context, anything to it. And I'll pass the to do form to it. So I'll say form and the form will be this to do form. Now that I've passed the form 
to the template, I can now extract the form inside of my HTML file and basically use the form. So the way that the form is used is basically specifying form. I will not specify the action yet, but I will specify the method to be post. And this form will have something called form.hidden tag. Now you remember that we set the secret key here inside of the application. So we need to use that secret key inside of the form. And again, the secret key is used by Flux to provide security to our form and it helps to protect the form from nasty attacks. So I'll say form.hidden underscore tag like so. So what this form.hidden tag template argument is doing is that it generates a hidden field that includes a token that is used to protect the form against CSRF attack. Now, all we need to do is to provide a secret key variable which is defined inside of the application config, which we've done over here. And then Flux will take care of the rest. Flux will take care, will use this form.hidden tag to protect the form. And that's all you need to know for now. Then I can come over here, since I have access to the form, and I'll say form.content, like so, and I'll say form.submit. So now if I start the application and I go to slash to do, what I have is a form with a submit button, which says to do. So that's how you use flux forms. Now that we know how to render the form in our view template, we need to see how to get data from the form. So if I say my name is the show, what I want to do is that when I submit, I need to be able to receive data from the form. So what I can do is to go into my view function. The method that this function is expecting is a get method but I would like to post this method as well. So I need to specify the method, the post method inside of the approved the creator. So I'll say post here as well. And then I need to tell my to do.html file that the action should be posted to slash to do. Now I do not have a database to store what the user types. So what I'm gonna do is to just print in the console the data that we get from the form. To do this, what I'm gonna use is the validate unsubmit function, which the form has. So I'll say, if to do form, the validate unsubmit, what I would like to do is to print the to do form, the content, the data, which is the data that the user puts in this field. I'm saying that if the form validates on submit, if the form successfully validates, print the data the user puts in the field, and then return redirect to the slash URL. So all I've done is I specified the request method post on the to do view function. Inside of the to do the HTML, I specified that the action should go to the slash to do. Then I'm using the validate on submit function, which processes the data that the user puts inside of the field. And I'm just redirecting to the slash root. So now if I go to the browser, and I type in my name is the show and I click on submit. If I check the terminal, as you can see, my name is the show. So that's how forms work in Flask. So the last video tutorial, we saw how to use Flux WT forms. So we made this, but as you can see, if I type in my name is the show and I click on submit to do, the data that I put inside of the field is not persisted. I'm not able to store the data. The data just goes. It gets logged in the terminal, but that's not what we want. When you're trying to build a complex application, you would like to have the ability to store the data that you put inside your field and then use it for something else later on in the application. So in today's video, we're gonna look at databases in Flask. To help us with persisting data, we'll be using the Flask SQL Alchemy extension. And the Flask SQL Alchemy extension provides Flask friendly wrapper to the popular SQL Alchemy package, which is an object relational mapper. ORMs allow us to manage databases using high level entities such as classes. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So what I'm going to do is basically install SQL Alchemy and I'll use pip install Flask SQL Alchemy. So I'll go to the Flask SQL Alchemy documentation, copy this, got my virtual environment activated. So I'll do pip install Flask SQL Alchemy. As I mentioned earlier, Flask SQL Alchemy allows us to manage databases using classes. 
So what I need to do is to create a class which will be my model. So what a model does is that the model will represent the data that will be stored in the database. So a model is basically a representation of what we want to store in the database. But before I can even create a model, what I need to do is to create a database URI and store that database URI into our application config. So if I go to the SQL Academy documentation, as you can see on this line, it says app.config SQL Alchemy database and then the database URI is SQL Alchemy slash tempt slash test.db. So I'll just copy this, go into the application and then paste this over here. But as you can see, right, it says that it is stored in a folder or directory called temp. So I need to create a directory in here called temp. So I'll come over here and I'll say mkdir tmp. And inside of this directory is where the test.db file will be stored. So now that I've set the SQL Alchemy database URI to this, what I now need to do is to create the model. So I'll create class to do model. So I've created a class called to do model and this to do model needs to inherit from the db.model, but I haven't created a db over here. If I go to the documentation again, as you saw, you need to create an instance of SQL Alchemy and pass the, your application to it, okay? So what I need to do is to copy this. And what this is saying is that I want to import from Flask SQL Alchemy, I want to import SQL Alchemy. So now I can create the DB and create an instance of SQL Alchemy and then pass the app to it. So I will say DB will be this and I will pass the app to it. Now I can pass DB, the model, to the to-do model. Just like the to-do form, which had the field as class variables, we will do the same thing for the to-do model. So inside of the to-do model, what I'm gonna do is to specify the ID of the model, and the ID will be db.column, and then I will set the ID to be the primary key, okay? So I will say db.integer, and then I will say that the primary key is true. Now the second field that I would like to store is what the user inputs in the field. So over here, I'll create a field with the name content, which I've assigned db.column, db.string 240. So I'm saying that the characters that it will store is 240 characters. I'll create a underscore underscore str underscore so that when I go to the terminal, I can see the string representation of this model, okay? So I will say that def underscore underscore str underscore underscore, I'll pass itself. And what I would like to return is basically self.content and then the ID will be self.id. This will return the string representation of the model. Now, if you look in here, this TMP directory is empty, but watch what happens when I initialize the database. Inside of the terminal, what I'm going to do is to type in Python. And what I need to do is that I need to import this DB from the app.py file. And after I've imported DB, um, I need to initialize the database and basically create, you know, the model that I want to create. So what I will say is that from app import DB, okay? So I need to now create the database. If I say for I in der DB print I, you can see DB has got something called create all which is a method that we will use to initialize the database, okay? So I'll come over here, db.createAll. Now, what this did is that this created a file called test.db inside of my temp directory, which is this directory that I have over here. So what I've done is that I've initialized the database. The next thing I need to do is to import the model because I want to create an instance of the model Again, what I said was that the model is the representation of the data that I want to store in the database. So I need to import the model and then use that for something. Now that I've imported this, I can go on and create an instance of the to-do model and pass in the fields that I want. So I will say to-do and to-do will be to-do model. The ID field is automatically generated by Flask. And uh, what I need to provide is the content field. So I will say content and I'll say content to be I want to eat like so. So basically what I've done is that I've created an instance of the to-do model and I've passed it 
you know, a field that I want, which is content. Now, what I need to do is to add the to do to the database because I've imported DB. I can say DB dot session dot add to do like so. So I've added to do, but this doesn't mean that it has persisted in the database. No, what it means is that I've added it. So in order for it to persist or in order for it to be saved into the database, what I need to say is that DB dot session dot commit. And now I have it saved in the database. So now if I say to do, I should get, okay. So there is something definitely wrong because of the way that this is displaying. In the string representation, I said I wanted the content and the ID, but it is giving me the model and the ID. So let's check the class and let's see if I did everything correctly. So you can see I'm doing something wrong over here. So this has to be like this. This has to be like that. So I have self.content and then I've got self.id. So let's do the whole process again and then we can get the string representation of the model. So now if I say that to do is equal to to do model dot query dot filter by ID one dot first and I say give me to do dot ID, I get ID one. If I say to do dot content, I get I want to eat. So basically I've been able to save into the database and the database has got a lot of SQL commands that you can use. Um, you can have a look at the SQL Alchemy database to learn more about the commands that you can use. You can basically order buy something, you can delete, you can get, there's a lot that you can do. So take your time and have a look at the SQL Alchemy documentation, have a look at it and then see how this is done. So if I go back into the application, let's see how we can get the data from the form and save it in our application rather than do it in a terminal. So now what I can do is that instead of printing what the user types in the input field, instead of printing that in the terminal, I can actually save that in the database and then use it somewhere else in our application. To do that, what I need to do is to create, like you saw in the terminal, is to create an instance of the model and then store the content in the content field. So what I will do is basically say that if the application validates on submit, what I want you to do is to create an instance of the database. So I will say that to do model will be to do and then the content will be the to do form content.data like so. I will remove this and all I need to say now is db.session.add. I want to add to do so I want to add this and then db.session dot commit to actually save that inside of the database. Now, when that is saved in the database, I get redirected to the slash URL, this page over here. So basically what I can do is to query the database, get all the data that has been stored inside of it and basically show that on the page. How you do that is basically by saying to do is the to do model dot query dot all which will query the database and give me everything that has been stored inside of it. So now I can pass this to do as to do will be to do. So I can go into the hello.html file and I'll have access to this to do. So if I go into the hello.html template, I'll put a HR tag over here. And what I will say is that for I in to do, and as you saw in the tutorial, I need to end for, what I want you to do is to give me the data. So what I can say is that give me I dot content like so. So if I now start the server and then type in something, now when I submit this, I get will this work over here. As you saw, the data has been stored in the database and now I have it here. If I do that same thing again, and I'll say, yes, this, it's working. I click submit to do. I have yes, this is working. So that is how we use databases in Flask. So the process of creating a database is basically creating a model. The model is the representation of the data that you want to store in your database. Once the model has been created, 
you need to give it the database URI, store that database URI inside of your application config. And this could be the URI for anything. So it could be PSQL, it could be SQL Alchemy, it could be MySQL, it could be any database that you want. Okay, you just have to read the documentation and get the URI that you need for that database. Once that is done, you need to go into your terminal, initialize your database to get to your database file and basically use it as you please. In the last video tutorial, we saw how to use databases in Flask. In today's video, we're gonna learn how to use Flask as a REST API for a React.js front end. So we go on to build this simple application, which is a to-do list application, which uses React.js and React routers. We will be able to add to a to-do list. We'll be able to click to get the details of one to-do. We'll be able to delete and we'll be able to edit as well. Then lastly, we will use React Spring to animate the to-do list. This will be done using Flux, React.js and React Routers. Let's get into it. The first thing I need to do is to create the React.js application and I can do that using Yarn Create React App My App. So now that this is completed, what I can do is to cd into my app. And then inside of the root of the application, what I'll do is to create a directory called API. Now I'll cd into API and I'll create a virtual environment by saying virtual env p python3 venv. If I'm going too quick for you, then you should check out the tutorial on how to connect a Flux backend to a React.js frontend. Now that this is done, what I'll do is to activate the virtual environment. And then once the virtual environment has been activated, what I need to do is to install Flask. So I'll come here and copy this, pip install Flask, and I'll do pip install Flask. Now that Flask has been installed, what I need to do is to create an api.py file inside of the root of my application. So I'll say touch api.py. And I can open this file. Now the first thing I will do is to import Flask from Flask. So say from Flask, import Flask. I'm not going to explain into details how this is done because I've already done a tutorial on that. So if you don't understand, watch the Flask tutorial before getting into this. So I'll go on and instantiate the Flask application. So I'll say app. Now that the app has been instantiated, I will say that if underscore underscore name underscore it's equal to underscore underscore main underscore the app dot run and I'll set debug to true. The next thing I'm going to do is to create a view function called index. So I'll say app the root slash methods get. And if someone goes to the index for now, what I want to return is hello world just to be able to connect the flux to the React application. And then I can go on and write the view function that I really need. So I will say return. And that's all I need for my view function for now. I'll go on and create a .env file. And in this .env file, I'll put in my environment config. So I'll come to the python.env documentation, copy this, go to the terminal and make sure that the virtual env has been activated. And what I'll say is pip install python.env. I will then go on to say touch .env. Inside of this .env file, what I will say is that the Flux EMV is development. Let me now start the Flux application and make sure that it is working. So I can go to this URL and actually do have hello world. So now I'll go to the front end and connect the front end to the back end. To do this, what I'll do is to go into the React application, go into my packet.json and create a proxy. So I will say proxy and I'll set the proxy to the flat URL. So I'll copy this, come over here and then paste that here, like so. So now I've set the flux URL as a proxy to the react.js application. Now the next thing I'll do is to create a component inside of my source directory. So I'll say components. And inside of this components, what I'll do is to create a components directory called card. So I'll say dash, and inside of this card, I'll create a card.js file. Now, what I'll do is to import React from React. So I'll say import React from React. 
Then I'll create a component called card. And this will be a functional component, which for now returns a div, which says hello. Then I need to export this. The next thing I'll do is to create a directory called pages. So the pages is where I'll bring all my components together to create the page that I want on my website. If you don't understand how I structure my React applications, check out the tutorial on how to structure React applications like a pro. So I'll come over here and I'll create pages. And instead of these pages, what I'll do is to create a new file called to do page.js and I'll import react from react. So I'll say import react from react. Then I'll also import this card from the card component. So I'll say import card from components. The next thing I'll do is to create the to do page components. So I'll say const to do page which will be a functional component. And this functional component will just render the card. Okay, so I'll say return, it's a React fragment, then I'll pass in card, like so. And lastly, I will export this, and then pass this to the app.js. So I'll go into the app.js file, get rid of everything here, and then I will import to do page. So this page from pages slash to do page. And what I can do, is to pass this here like so. So now if I start the application, I should see hello, okay? So I'll go on and start the React application. So as you can see, it says hello. Now I know that the front end is working properly. So I can go on and make a fetch request to the back end and see if I can get the data from the back end and use it on the front end. So I can go into the React application and then on the to-do page, what I'll do is to import use state and use effect from React. So I've now imported use state and use effect from React. So I can go on and create a state. So I'll say const to-do and then set to-do and this will be use state, which is initially an empty array, like so. And I can go on and say use effect and what I'll say is that the use effect is that I want to fetch from slash API. Now, since we're using the Flux application as a REST API, I need to change the roots on the backend to slash API. So I'll come back here and instead of saying slash, I'll say slash API like so. Then I'll go back to the front end and I'll say fetch slash API, but then response if the response that okay i want you to return response to json the then data for now i want you to console the log the data like so so what i'm actually doing is that i'm fetching data from the slash api endpoint and if the response is okay i just want to console the log the data just to see that the back end has been connected with the front end correctly and everything is working before I go on to add complexity to it. So I'll start the React and Flux server and see if everything is working correctly. And over here, make sure you add an array so that you make one request, else you end up making a lot of requests. So now this is done, let's see what I get in the console. And as you can see, I get an object called hello. So it means that the back end has been connected correctly with the front end. And if you don't agree, if I come over here and return a list of names, so orange and then apple i now get an array of orange and apple so i know that everything is working correctly so this is how you connect your react.js front end to your flux application the next thing we are going to do is actually create the root that will enable us to create the rest api in order to persist data we need a database so when someone goes to the application on the front end type in into a field we need to be able to store that in a database in the back end. So what I'm gonna do is to install Flask SQL Alchemy. So I'll copy this. I have my virtual EMV activated, so I'll say pip install Flask SQL Alchemy. Again, if you don't know what Flask SQL Alchemy is, check out the tutorial on how to use databases in Flask. So now that this is done, I'll come down here and I'll set inside of my application config the SQL Alchemy database URI. I'll change this to DB. So the next thing I'm going to do is to import SQL Alchemy. So I'll say from Flask, SQL Alchemy, import SQL Alchemy, like so. 
So what I've done is to set the SQL Alchemy database URI in my application config and I've imported SQL Alchemy from Flask SQL Alchemy. The next thing I need to do is to create a model. If you saw in the tutorial on how to use databases in Flask, you need to create a class, which is a model, and that class will be the representation of the data that you want to store in the database. If you don't understand this, make sure you check that out before watching this one. So what I'll do is to create an instance of SQL Alchemy. So I'll say DB will be SQL Alchemy, like so, and I need to pass it the app, okay? The app is currently none, so I need to pass it this app. So I'll pass it this up and now what I can do is to create a model. So how you create a model is basically by saying class, I'll call this to do and this class will inherit from db.model. So I'll say db.model and it will have two class variables. One is id and this id will be db.column, db.integer because I want the id to be an integer field and then I'll set the primary key to true. The next thing I would like to store is the content field. So what the user puts in the input field. So I'll create a field called content and this content will be db.column. So I'll copy this, paste that here and I'll change this db.integer to db.text and I'll set nullable to false, which means it cannot be empty. The last thing I'll do is to create the underscore underscore str underscore so that I can get the string representation of this model. So I'll pass in self and what I want to return is self.id and then self.content. So this underscore underscore str underscore will give me the string representation of this model. Now that I have the database model created, what I need to do is to initialize my database. So I'll go into the terminal and type in Python. And what I'll say is that from API, import db and then I'll say db dot create underscore all like so and what this command does is that it created this example dot db which is basically this okay the next thing I'll do is to import the model so I'll say from api import to do and I will create an instance of this model and basically see the database with some content Okay, so I'll say to do is basically to do and the content that I would like to give it is basically I need to eat. Then I'm going to add this. So I'm saying db session add to do. Then I'm going to actually persist this or save this. So I'll say db .session commit. If you don't understand how this is done, again, check out the tutorial on how to use databases in Flask. So I do have some data in my database. Now I will exit. Actually, let me add one more data into the database. So I'll say second to do, it's another to do. And I'll say content, I need to learn Flask. And I'll say db.session.add second to do. Then I'll say db.session.commit, like so. So I can exit from here. What I want the index function to do is that when someone goes to slash API, what I want to do is to query the data in the database. So I want to get everything that has been stored in the database and then display that on the front end. That is basically what I want my index function to do. Now, I would like to show you guys something. What some people will tend to do was that they would create a variable called to do and what they will say is that to do dot query dot all and they will assume that this will return everything that has been stored in the database and then what they can say is that return a dictionary of to do now if i start the application you realize that i'll get an error let's see what this error is i get this error saying that object of type to do is not json serializable so what I need to do now is to serialize the object. So in order to avoid this error, what I will do is to create a to-do serializer. So I'll come over here and create a method called to-do serializer. And what this to-do serializer would do is that it will take a to-do and then it will return an object with an ID key and the value will be set to to-do.id and then it will have a content key and this content key will be set to to-do 
app.content like so so instead of returning an object with a key name and the value to do what i'll do is to import jsonify from flask and instead return jsonify which is used to convert something into json and i want to jsonify the map and as you know the map takes in the function and an iterable so what i'll do is to pass in the function and the function will be the to do serializer and the iterable will be the to do dot query dot all so this so now i can get rid of this and what i need to do is that whatever is returned by the map i would like to unpack that okay i would like to unpack that into this array so i need to add a star over here and i will unpack that so basically now if i start the flux application then i go to slash api i now have a list which contains two objects so what the star was doing was that i was unpacking the object into the array i hope this makes sense so now that we have some data in the database rather than saying console.log data what i'm going to do is to actually set the data to the data that we get from the database so what i'm going to do is to say set to do then i'll pass it data like so so now i can go into this card component and then use the data okay so what I'll do is to pass to the card component a prop called list of to do's. So I'll say list of to do's. And this list of to do's will be the to do state. So I'll pass it this. I can now go into the card.js file and then extract the list of to do. So I can extract this from here. And rather than returning just hello, what I'm going to do is to look through the list of to-dos. So I'll say list of to-dos, the map, and each to-do. What I would like to do is to return a UL tag. And this UL tag will contain an LI tag. And this LI tag will have to-do.content, like so. So if I check the front end of the application, as you can see, I have I need to eat and I need to learn Flask. But then if I inspect the console, as you can see, I've got some errors because I need to provide it the key. So what I will do is to come over here and then pass it a key prop with the ID to be to do.id. Now this error should be gone. So we know that everything has been integrated well and everything is working. The next step will be to create the form component, which will allow the user to input data and that data will then be stored in the database. Let's see how this is done. To create a form, instead of my components directory, I'll create a directory called form. And instead of this form directory, I'll create a form.js file. Then I'll go on to say import react from react. Then I'll create a component called form, which is a functional component. And what this functional component would do is that it will return fragment and this fragment will contain a form which has two input fields one is a test input field and one is a submit field the next thing i will do is to make sure that the user puts something inside of the input field so i'll set required here now what i'll do is to export the form and then i'll import the form inside of my to-do page so inside of the to-do page what i'll do is to copy this and change this to form and components, this has to be form. And then I'll render the form components right here. So now if I check the browser, I should have a form and the list of to-dos. But as you can see, I'm not able to track whatever I type in here. And that needs to change. And what I will do is to set some state inside of my to-do page. So I will come over here and I'll say const add to-do. And I'll create something called set add to do. And this will be state. So use state, which is initially an empty string. And the next thing I'm going to do is to pass these states as a prop to the form. So inside of the form component, what I'll pass is called the user input. And I'll set the user input to the add to do. Then I can go into the form component and then extract the user input. So I'll copy this and I'll paste this here. 
And what I will do now is to basically set the value of the input field to the user input state, which is initially an empty string. Right now, when I type in something, it doesn't work because I've set the state of this input field to an empty string. If I come over here and I put in Chris, this will change to Chris because that is the state. That is what the, in the value of the input field is. So now I need to be able to track what the user types in the input field and set that to the state. So in the form component, I'll create an unchange prop. So unchange, and I'll set this unchange prop to something called handle change. So I'll say handle change. Now, as you can see, I've got nothing called handle change over here. Okay. So what I will do is to create a function called handle change. So instead of my form component, I'll create a constant called handle change. And this will take in an event. For now, I will console.log event.target.value. So I'll say console.log event.target dot value but what i actually want to happen is that when someone changes something in this input field i want to set the state to what the person has typed in here so instead of my to do page what i will do is to create a function called handle form change so i'll create a constant called handle form change and this will be a function so it will set this to whatever the user types, okay? So this will take in an input value, then I'll set add to do to that input value. And so I will change the state of this. So now I need to pass this handle form change to the form component. So what I'll do is to create a prop call on form change, and I'll assign this on form change to this handle form change. Then I can go into my form component. So I'll copy this, then I will extract this from here. So now instead of saying console.log event.target.value, what I will do is to say on form change event.target.value. So now let's see what happens when I change something in the input field. And before I do that, I need to set this back to an empty string so that I will have the field empty. Now if I type in something here, it's still not working. Let's see something. So I'll inspect. And as you can see, there's an error. So I might have spelled something wrongly. So I'll go back into VS Code and then change this to unchanged. So it's a capital C. Now I'll go back to the browser. So now if I type in something here, it works. Okay. And I can actually console.log that. So console.log add to do. So which is actually the state. So, so now if I change something in the input field, as you can see, I get those logged over here. So we know that we are able to track the state and what the user types in over here. Now let's find a way to handle submit. Now to handle submit, I'll do something similar. So I'll come into the form.js file. And instead of the form.js file, what I'll do is to create a function called handle submit. So I'll say const handle submit. And what this handle submit will do is that it will take in an event and I'll say event prevent default, which will stop it from posting, so submitting. On the form, I'll create a prop called unsubmit, and I'll assign to this unsubmit prop handle submit, like so. So currently, if I say I want to sleep, and I click on submit, nothing happens. But what I actually want to happen is that I want to send this data to the Flux server, and then store that in the database. So in order to do that, when I click on submit, what I need to actually do is to send a push request to the server and then store the data in the database. So what I will do is basically go into the to-do page and then create a function that will do this for me. Okay. So I will say handle form submit, and this will be a function that will fetch to slash API slash. And I know I haven't created this endpoint but I'll call this endpoint create because I want to use this endpoint to create a new to-do, okay? And the method that I will specify is a post method. So I'll say method and I'll set the method to post. Then I'll set the body, the key to be JSON 
to stringify. So JSON to stringify is used to convert the body into JSON. And I'll say content. And I'll set the content to basically the add to do. So what I'm saying is that when a user types in something here and the person clicks on submit, get the data that the person types in here and then send that data to slash API slash create. And what I will do is that I'll pass this as a prop to the form. So I'll go to the form, then I'll say on form submit, then I'll pass it the handle form submit. I'll come over here, extract that. And then when someone submits the application, what I want to do is to call this method. So I haven't actually created this endpoint. So what I will do is to go into the Flux application and create this endpoint. So now instead of the Flux application, what I will do is to create a method called create. So def create, and it has to be at app slash API slash create. Then I'll set the methods to post. The next thing I'll do is that I'll create a variable called request data and the request data will be the data that I get from the request. So I need to import request from Flask. So the request data will be request.data and that will basically give me what the user puts in here. It will give me the body of the request, okay? That is the request data. And what I need to do is to convert the request data into a Python dictionary. So what I'll do is to import JSON from Flask. So I'll say JSON, then I'll convert this to a Python dictionary by saying JSON, the loads, request data. Now that I've converted this to a Python dictionary, what I'll do is to say that to do, is the instance of to do. So it's the instance of this to do model. And the content will be the request data. And I want to extract the content field from the request data. So I'll say content like so. The next thing I'll do is to add this to the session. So I'll say DV the session dot add to do, then I will say dv dot session dot commit like so. And then what I actually want to happen is that when the dv is committed, I want to return a dictionary with a key 201, which means it has been created. And then a message saying to do created successfully like so. Now, if I go back to the React application, Inside of the to do page, what I can actually do is to set the headers and then handle the response. So what I'll do is that here I will say headers, which will be a JavaScript object with the content. Now set the content type to application slash JSON char set will be UTF dash eight. But then what I want to happen is that I want to get the response, return the response to JSON I need to get rid of this, but then the message will be console.log message for now. So the message will actually be this. So what is actually being returned when I put to the slash API slash create root. So now let's see what happens if this is actually created and then we can go on and build on top of it. So now if I come to the browser, then I inspect then I say, I need to shower and I click submit. It says handle submit is not a function. So let's see what is happening and then we can fix that. Okay, so I passed handle submit over here instead of on form submit. So what I will do is to copy this, go to the form, then change this to on form submit, then change that to on form submit like so. Now let's try again. So now if I say I need to learn Python and I click on submit, it says response to JSON is not a function. So let's see what's happening again. Okay, so it's JSON like so. And as you can see, I have, I need to learn Python here. So now you say I need to sleep and I click on submit. 
I get to do crater successfully. Okay, but as you can see, this is not cleared when I click on submit. So now let's make a change so that this is cleared when I submit. To do this, what I'm going to say is that console.log the message and then I'll set the set add to do to an empty string. So I will say set add to do and I'll set this to an empty string like so. So now let's try again. If I say I need to learn Java, it is cleared now. So now we know that everything is working. But as you can see, if I type in I need to sync, then I click on submit. The front end is not updated immediately. I always have to refresh this to make this happen. So what I need to do now is that when I submit something, I need to make a fetch request to the back end again and get the latest to do. So how I do that is basically by saying const get latest to do which will also be a function and I'll fetch from slash API but then response if response dot okay return response dot JSON dot then the data will be set to do then I'll pass it the data like so. So now if I go back to the browser then I say I need to shit and I click submit it gets updated immediately. Now let me get rid of these bullet points and I can do that by saying inside of my app.css, what I'm going to do is to set the list style type to none. So currently on the main page, I have a list of to do, but I cannot click on them. Okay, I do not have a page that shows just one single to do. So what I'll do is to go back to the Flux application and create a show route that will give me each to do. So inside of the Flux application, I'll create another function called show. And this show will take an ID and I'll say at app the root slash API slash int ID. When someone goes to the slash API slash an ID, what I want you to do is to query the database. So I will say return Sonify, I will unpack the map, then I'll pass it the to do serializer. And what I will do is to say that to do the query dot filter, and I want to filter by ID, and the ID will be the ID that is sent in the get request. So basically, if someone goes to slash API with an ID, what I want to do is to query the database and filter by that ID and return that thing. Now to use this on the front end, I need to be able to click on a to do in order to go to that to do. So I will have to install React Routers. So to install React Routers, I'll come over here and I'll copy this yarn add React Router. And inside of the root of the React application where I've got the packet.json, I'll say yarn add React Router. And since we are building a web app, what we also need to do is to install React Router DOM. So I'll come over here and I'll say yarn add react router DOM. So now that react router has been installed, what I'll do is to go into my application and then inside of my app.js file, I need to import some things from react router DOM. So I'll come over here, then I'll copy this, go into the application, then I'll paste that here. So what I've done is that I've imported browser router switch roots and link from React Router DOM. So now, instead of just returning a div with the to-do page component, what I will do is that I will wrap this inside of a router. So what I will say is that router, and inside of this router, I will have a switch, which is basically this, okay? So the router is this, and I'll have a switch, which is that. So what a switch does is that a switch looks through its children routes and renders the first one that matches the current URL. So basically that's what a switch does. And inside of this switch, I'll have a root. And this root, I'll specify a path. And I'm telling React that if the path is slash, what I want you to do is to render the to do page like so. So now I can get rid of this and I'll copy this whole thing. And I'll put this whole thing inside of the div like so. So now if I come over here and I say slash about, 
as you can see i still get this page because the exact match that i think i'm fine is the slash and the slash results to the to do page okay the next thing i'm going to do is to create a show page which will enable me to do something like slash one and then i can get one to do so to build the show page what i'll do is to come over here and inside of my pages what i'm going to create is a show page file so i'll say show .js. now inside of this show page what i need to do is to import react from react then i'll create a functional component called show and what this component will do is that it will have some states okay so i'll have const to do then i'll have set to do and the states will be use states so what i actually want to happen is that if a person comes over here and a person clicks on i need to eat i want to make a fetch request to the flux server and then get the data for this to do okay so what i need to do is that inside of the show page i need to import use state and then use effect from react and then i will say that use effect which takes in a function and i'll say that if someone clicks on each to do what i want you to do is to fetch from slash api slash an id that i will provide you okay and i need to define this id now i can only get this id from the url and react router comes with something called use params so react router comes with a hook called use params okay and this use params will enable me to get something from the url so i'm going to use use params to get the id from the url so to use use params what i'll do is to copy this come over here and then get rid of all of that because i don't really need them and then what i can say is that const id because the use params is an object so i'm extracting the id from that object will be use params so now i have the id okay so i'm making a fetch request to slash api slash with the id and that will obviously make a request to this endpoint so it will make a request to this endpoint then i'm saying that the then response i want the response the json the then data i want to set to do so this and I want to set that to the data that I get. And then what I will say is that if the ID changes, I want you to make a new request, okay? So if this ID changes, what I want you to do is I want to make a new request and get me a new data. And what I would like to return is basically a div and I'll say to do dot length, if it's greater than zero, then what I want you to do is to map. So I'll say to do dot map the data and I want to div with the data dot content like so so now i can export this and then i can use that inside of my app.js file so i'll go into the app.js file and what i need to do is to import the show page so i'll say import pages and show like so the next step will be to wrap this in the root so i'll copy this paste that here and instead of saying to do page i'll say show like so and then now the path will be slash with something called id okay because i need to pass an id to this url so it is no longer slash it is slash with an id now let's see how this works if i go to the browser everything is working and i type in slash one see what happens it doesn't work because switches will match the first thing that matches the slash and the first thing that matches the slash is the root to slash. So to stop this from happening, what I need to do is to pass the root to the slash URL and the exact prop like so. And now I can try again. Now I get I need to eat. And if I put in slash four, I get I need to sleep. And if I put in slash two, I get I need to learn flat. So what is exactly happening in the show page? Now, as you can see, I passed in a number one. If I hit enter, it changes. If I put in four, it changes. So basically, this number is the ID. 
Okay, so this number is grabbed from the URL and it is passed as a parameter to the slash API endpoint. And then I get the data for that. And once that ID changes, I make another fetch request and I use the data to populate the div. So that is basically what's happening inside of the show page. I still cannot click on these to do. So what I need to do is to make these a link. And when I click on I need to eat, I will be redirected to slash one, which is I need to eat. To do this, I'll use link from React Router DOM. So I'll go into my card component. And inside of this card component, what I'll do is that I'll import link. And inside of the card, rather than saying an li tag of to do the component, what I'll do is to wrap this inside of a link. Okay, so I have the li tag. And I'll also have a link. So I'll say link. Then since to get to the show page, so if I go to the app.js file, in order to get to the show page, I need to pass it an ID. Okay, I need to pass it an ID. What I'll do is to pass this an ID. And that can be passed with a two prop. And I can specify this to be to do dot ID, like so. So now if I go back to the browser and I go to slash, these are all links. So if I click on this, I get taken to I need to eat. If I click back and I click on this, I get taken to I need to learn Flask. If I go back and I click on this, I get taken to I need to sleep. The next thing I'm going to do is to build in the ability for users to delete a to-do. So in order to do that, what I'll do is to come into my app.py file and what I'll say is that at app the root slash API with a number, which I will specify as ID, the method should be post. Then I'll define this method to be delete. And it will take in that ID that I pass here. And when I get the ID, what I want to do is to say request data will be JSON, the loads which as I mentioned earlier, is used to convert JSON into Python dictionary and I'll pass in the requested data. The next thing I'll do will be to query the database. So I'll say to do dot query filter by and I'll filter by the ID that the user passes. The next thing I'll do to make this persist will be to actually delete it from the database. So I'll say db dot session dot comment. Then I'll return a dictionary with a 204 key set to delete it successfully. So what I've basically done is to create a function called delete. This function takes in an ID, which is the ID that the user passes. I convert the request body into a Python object. I query the database to filter by the ID that the user passes, then I delete it. Then I actually delete it from the database using the db.session.commit. Then I return this object saying 204 deleted successfully. The next thing I'll do will be to build a delete component inside of the React application. So I'll close this, come over here, and then inside of the component, what I'll do is to create a directory called delete. Then inside of this delete directory, I'll create a delete.js file. Then I'll create a component called delete, which is a functional component. And all it does is that it returns a React fragment with a button, then I'll export this. So what I need to actually do is that when I click on the delete button, I want to make a push request to the flag server and actually delete the data from the database. So I'll create a function called delete to do. And what this function will do is that it will fetch to slash API slash an ID that I'll provide. The method will be post and then the body will be JSON, the stringify ID, which is the ID. But the question is, where do I get this ID from? Now I need to pass the ID when I click on delete. So I know that it will be passed in as a prop. So I'll pass this ID to it later on inside of the page. Then what I want to happen is that I will say that then response, response.json, that then data, what I want you to do is to console the log, the data, so the message, and then I want to be redirected to the slash URL. And I can do that using the use history 
that React Router DOM provides. So I'll say import use history from React Router DOM. So I'll come over here and I'll create a constant called history and I'll set this as use history like so. And after I've logged the data, what I'll do is that redirect me. So history dot push to slash. So use history is also a hook. And what it does is that it gives you the instance or the history instance of the route that you want to navigate to. So now I have this component built. What I can do is to use this inside of the show page. Okay. So I'll go into the show page and inside of this page, I'll say import. I want to import delete from components slash delete like so. And then over here, I can use that component. So I can say delete Then I'll pass it the prop ID, which will basically be the ID. So the ID that is provided over here. And whilst I'm here, let me create an HR tag, which will link me back to the to do's. So I'll say link and I will say back to to do's. And this link will have a to prop, which will take me to the slash route. So now I need to import link from React Router. So now if I go to the browser and I click on I need to eat, I can delete this. It's not working. So let's see, inspect and see what's happening. I can come over here then I can give it a key and I can set the key to ID. Okay, so now this is not working and rightfully it shouldn't work because I haven't set the on click button. So what I need to do is to say, if this button is clicked, so on click, I would like to call this method, so delete to do. Like so. And now if I go back to the browser and I do delete, so it's not working because I said data, this has to be data, okay? Because it's the request the data. So now if I go back to the application, then I click on delete, it gets deleted. It says deleted successfully. So if I click on, I need to learn flux and I click delete, it gets deleted as well. If I click on this and I click on back to to-dos, I get redirected back to the to-do page. The next thing I'll do is to create the edit button. So when I click on this one, I need to be able to edit a to-do, but I'm not gonna do that. I will leave it up to you to do it because it is always easy when you watch someone do it than to actually do it yourself. So try to build the edit button. And then when you click on the edit button, you'll be taken on a page which will allow you to edit and save. If you have any questions regarding that, don't hesitate to ask me. So the last thing I'm going to do is to actually create the animation. And what I will use for this is React Spring. If you don't know how to use React Spring, I've got lots of tutorials on that. You can check them out. But I will come over here and copy this. And inside of the roots of the React application, I'll do yarn add React Spring. What I would like to animate is the card component. So I'll come into the card component. And what I'll actually do is to import use transition from React Spring. So I will say import use transition and then animate it from React Spring. Then I'll go on and create the spring that I want. So I'll say const. And as you know, use transition, I need to pass it the number of springs that I want. And the number of springs that I want will be the list of to-dos and list of to-dos.id. And I need to provide it with the CSS that I want. So basically what I'm doing is I'm using use transition from React Spring. And the use transition, the first thing that it takes is that it takes in the list of to-dos. The second thing is a function that returns the list of to-dos.id and then an object, which is the form and enter. And instead of returning a list of to-do the map, what I'm going to actually do is to return this. So now if I go into the application, as you can see, everything gets animated. So if I go here and I delete, things are now animated. If I say I need to dance, everything gets animated now. And that's basically it. So what we've looked at is how to use Flask as a REST API for a React application, connect Flask to React, 
and build a to-do application which allows you to add to a to-do click on a to-do which we are able to do that using react routers able to delete from a to-do and be able to edit which i've left up to you to do it thank you guys for watching and i'll see you next time